Romans chapter number one, if you will. I want to get, get on with this this morning because time will get away. Romans chapter one, verse number 16 and 17. We're kind of looking at these verses a little bit, um, a, little, a little more closely. This is the, the 21st session in the book of Romans. Uh, so we're down to 16, 17 verses. We're actually doing pretty good, uh, you know, pace-wise. Verse 16 uh, Romans 16, for, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That verse, those two verses, are, are as I've said to you, sort of concise summary of the book. Uh, the explosive dynamic of the gospel of Christ um, is demonstrated, especially in verse 17, I call the message this morning the, the, the verse that changed history. I, I, you don't, if you don't study church history, nobody studies much of history anymore anyway. And, uh, you know, you've got to be an old guy like me to remember some of these things. If you're under 30 years old, you, you didn't learn. You, the history you learned was different than the history I learned. And I guess that's the way progressive through life is. But that verse 17 for, for this is the second reason Paul's not ashamed of the gospel. First, he knows it works. It, it is the power of God to salvation. Also, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. For the just shall live by faith. That verse, the just shall live by faith, is the verse that altered the course of, of, of Western civilization. Almost any historian will tell you, uh, if they're versed in, 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 in the history of the West, that that verse has, as, has had as a profound an effect upon the history of the Western world as the Magna Carta or the Declaration of Independence. Now, secular historians might not tell you that. They used to would. That passage is the passage that, when I say, when I said, I'm going to read you something out of, out of a, I didn't bring the history books. I brought some pages out of it. But I say that because that's the verse that made Martin Luther. And Martin Luther is the man who made the, 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 the dramatic change in the history of, of Western civilization. Martin Luther was, was I'm going to read this to you. When Martin Luther entered into the newness of, of life, the face of the world changed. It was as though all the windows of Europe had been suddenly thrown open. And the sunshine came streaming in everywhere. The destiny of empires was turned that day into a new channel. That's Carlyle, the great English historian. And, and he talks about Luther being a great man, a, a, a man of great intelligence, integrity, a mighty man. And he, he said that Luther, the moment when Luther defied the wrath of the Diet of Worms, was the greatest moment in the history of the West. Well, you don't even know what the dot of worms is. You look at me like, what are you talking about? Worm? That's when he stood before the, the Roman church and said, when they called him in for preaching the gospel, called him in for having spread the just to live by faith all across the, the, the continent, and something like 70% of, of, of Christendom at the time had, had realized that they could be free from the shackles of Romanism. He's called before the church council, and it was his declaration that, uh, that have, you know, this is what God's word says, my conscience is bound by the word of God, I can do no other. And he was, he was exiled and defrocked and sent in, into exile, and yet the message that he preached based on that verse right there there, there, there are two libraries that in the ancient world, the library, uh, the convent library at, at Erfurt has a picture of Luther. And it's, it's a picture of him as a young man, and he's, he's studying the scripture. And there's the, the window, the light comes out through the window, and this is, this is the, the, the picture. The light comes through the window and enlighten, and, 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 and enlighten, lightens up the just shall live by faith. And that picture pictures what it was that propelled Luther. There's another library where it's the library at Rudolfstadt. I'm not a German, so I can't say those words the way they would say them. But where Luther's son, Dr. Paul Luther, his youngest son, 
in a handwritten document talks about his dad's testimony. He says, in the year 1544, my dearest father, in the presence of all, narrated the whole story of his journey to Rome. He acknowledged that the, with great joy that in that city, through the Spirit of Jesus Christ, he had come to the knowledge of the truth of the everlasting gospel. And he talks about going through the, the, the stairs at St. John's of, of, of Laterna, the, the, the stairs where the penitents would cry, crawl up the stairs, and the pilgrimage would weep and their way up the stairs. And they had done it for hundreds and hundreds of years and trying to do penance. And it was on those stairs that Luther, as he crawled up those stairs, reciting the prayers to, uh, of confession, it was there that the Holy Spirit broke into, into his mind <clears throat> those glorious words of, the just shall live by faith. And it's on those stairs that Luther says upon uh, the, the, the story in, 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 the light, in the handwriting of his sons c concludes, Therefore he ceased his prayers, returned to Wittenberg, and took this as the chief foundation of his doctrine. My point to you is that the thing that made Luther, if Luther made the Western world, the thing that made Luther was that verse right there. And that's a, I, I say that to you, you need to understand in history... This verse has been something that's been, been that explosive power to drive the dynamic of the truth of the gospel. And the whole of the Protestant Reformation and the whole of the, of the church down through the past 2,000 years has been based upon the truth of that simple statement. Now, I want to take a moment and look at it with you. I wish I had six hours. I don't. I know I don't. So I'm not going to take six hours, but I'm going to take 43 minutes, okay? And maybe 45 minutes. <laughs> the just shall live by faith. What, what, what a statement. Um, you don't know who Leon Tucker was. Again, I, if you go around my office, I've got books, and people were asking me about what kind of books, this kind of books, and that kind of thing. Stan died, and his son says, well, my dad's got all these books. Does anybody would like them? When you're older, guys, you collect up books from the past. Leon Tucker was a was a friend of J.C. O'Hare's back in the, in the 20s and the 30s. He had a little magazine he published called The Word of Truth, and he was one of those men who were stalwarts of preaching dispensational truth the early part, 100 years ago. And he has a little book on the, <coughs> excuse me, on the book of Romans, and he talks about this verse. He said, these, these two verses, Romans 1, 16 and 17, form a brief of the contents of the book. It's evident by the occurrence of the words. Now, now listen to this information. The, gospel, the term gospel occurs 10 times. He picks out 11 words out of Romans 1, 16 and 17. So these are 11 key words. Gospel, it occurs 10 times in the book. Lord Jesus Christ occurs 32 times. Lord, 30 times. Christ, 33 times. Jesus, twice. The word power appears 12 times. In the book, the name of the name God is found 188 times in the book of Romans. Salvation twice, belief 15 times. Righteousness occurs 44 times. Just, justify, justification 20 times. The word faith 34 times. Those 11 words in these two verses occur 462 times in the book. That's why he's saying these verses are the seed plot of what's, what's left in the book of Romans. These 11 words, Lucker, Tucker says, mag mean, these seven, seven words magnified in such a way means God glorified, Christ deified, his offering ratified, guilty man justified, the believer crucified, sanctified, satisfied, and waiting to be glorified. <laughs> I, read, I, I want to read all that just to read you that. There's something glorious about, the, about this text that you need to look at. So I want to just take it apart for you. For therein, in the gospel of Christ, is the righteousness of God. And by the way, you know, we talk about, therein, we talk about the gospel a lot, and we don't always say the gospel of Christ. We should. Verse 16, when it talks about the gospel of Christ, if you've got a Bible other than a King James Bible, it doesn't say the gospel of Christ, it just says the gospel. Alex and I this past week were at a pastor's appreciation brunch put on by the radio station, WYLL. And we both noticed all these pastors and their, their wives there and all the, the hoopla that was going on. And people talk about, they did, they did talk about the gospel, but nobody ever explained what it was. 
we're sitting at a table with some Bible church people, and we, we these guys were saved. They knew what the gospel was. Table next to us, I'm not sure they knew what what what, what even used the term God. It was a it was a a disturbing morning, frankly, because if that's a picture of the church, the evangelical church in Chicago, I'm, we're in trouble. Yeah. Because it, and the speakers. They would talk about the gospel, but then you'd get the idea that the gospel they're talking about is a works program of some some sort. The gospel of Christ is that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day for our justification. Amen. He died for our <laughs> sins. He was buried according to the scripture. The, the, val, the historical validation of his death is his burial. It's, it's authenticated by the word of God. He was raised again the third day according to the scripture, validated, authenticated by the word of God. And then he was seen. You have the historical validation, not just the scripture, but the literal historical validation. He was seen to people that knew him the best, knew him the most closely. And then he was seen to 500 at one time. I mean, if you have that kind of evidence, historically available evidence, the reality is, is, is to deny it is to deny reality. But the purpose of his death and resurrection, the gospel in the death, burial, and resurrection is that he died for your sins. The purpose of his death. Therein, in his death, his resurrection, his cross work, therein is revealed the righteousness of God, the rightness of God. God's character. Come back with me to Numbers 23. I, I, every time I think about this, I, dear Brother Crumb down in Shorewood Bible Church South, Brother Art Johnson's ministry, when Brother Crump, every time he preaches, you know, Brother Morris Chestnut down at Ridge Farm, every time he speaks, the guy says, oh, Morris is going to talk about Genesis. And I sit there waiting for him to talk about Genesis. When I hear Brother Crump, I wait for him to quote this verse. He quotes it pretty much every time he preaches. Numbers 23, verse number, number something, what is it? It's 21. It's not that either. I'm... <laughs> I, now I wrote the wrong reference down. Well, that, that's, that's kind of dumb of me, isn't it? Anyway, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man. <laughs> you know that verse? Well, that's Brother Crumb's verse, so I, can't, I, I didn't write the right reference down. 2119. Okay, thank you, ma'am. 2319. See, you're, you're able to see better than I. You see these glasses I got on? They really don't work. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad, I'm glad you're sharp out there. You know, we, last Sunday, I, I was, you know, we were st- going and I give a reference. You, heard, you hear all that rustling of the leaves? It's fall, but that's not the leaves outside. That's your Bible. You know how often you go to church and you never hear that? Yeah. Yep. That's why we call it a Bible church. It's our middle name. 2319, there it is. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent, that he change his mind. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? That's the rightness of God. That's God's righteousness. God is going to do what's right no matter what. And in the gospel, the rightness of God is manifested, it's revealed. Now when he talks about that, come back with me to Exodus chapter number 33 and 34. Get Exodus 34 in one hand. In Proverbs chapter 17. Proverbs chapter 17. You know this verse. Proverbs 17 verse 15. He that judgeth, I'm sorry, he that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just... Even they both are abomination to the Lord. When it says God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he would repent. God won't do something that's wrong. He, he that just, if you justify the wicked and you condemn the just, that's an abomination. Well, what did God do at Calvary? He condemned the just one so that he could justify the wicked one. You say, well, what is that? That's the grace of God. But how could God do that and still be right in doing it? Look at Job, Job 
chapter 8. We're, going to, we're, we're working our way over to Exodus. Job chapter 8. Verse number 20. Bildad says, Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he help evildoers. That's the righteousness of God. That's God's attribute of perfect rightness, purity, retributive justice, holds you accountable to the absolute standard of his rightness. So chapter 9, verse number 1 starts, Job answered, I know it is of truth, but how shall a man be just before God? See, that's the real question. God holds you accountable. And because there's not a just man on the face of the earth to do with good and sinneth not, how can you be just with how can you be just with a perfect God? Exodus chapter thirty four, verse number five. The Lord, in Exodus 33, Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. And the Lord says, okay, sit over behind that rock. I put my hand on you. And I walk by, and I let say my backside as I go by. And here's what he saw. Verse 5, the Lord, 34, 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. All that other stuff was great until you got there, because if you're guilty, he doesn't, he'll never cover up your sin. He'll never pass over your sin. He'll never have your sin not be accounted for. That's the rightness of God. So how can the rightness of God be revealed in the gospel? Go back with me to Romans chapter 3. And notice verse 26. This is the verse to keep in mind. Romans 3, verse 26. You can start in verse 24 if you want to being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. So where does justification come from? It's God that justifies. But it comes through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. I've defined for you through the years, grace is all that God is free to do for you through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the gift of His life because of Calvary. Verse 26, to declare I say, to declare it's revealed to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The righteous character of God is able to be just. Why? Because God made him to be sin for you. All of the justice of God is satisfied in what he does. Then he can give you his righteousness. God made him to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the righteousness of God that's revealed in the gospel is how, how God's, God's character, God's capacity, God's ability to properly deal with sin, put it away, and give you his righteousness. When the verse says, in the gospel of Christ is revealed the righteousness of God. When talking about the righteousness of God, it's not just the, the righteous character of God. The law, many, listen, all through the Bible, they know about God's righteous character. What's revealed in the gospel is his right use, his right handling, his right <clears throat> dealing with our sin, having it all paid for, having it all dealt with, and then having the ability to give you his, his life, his righteousness. You're in Romans, look back at chapter 2. Here's, here's the deal. The gospel of Christ is going to reveal God acting righteously on the basis of the cross work of Christ. His, his, the, 
His death allows God to justly deal with our sin and justly give you his righteousness. By the way, to be justified, to be declared by God for you to be righteous. The word justified, the old timers used to say it means just as if I never sinned. And that's, that's a, a part of it, but that's not the whole of it. Now, a lot of folks, they said, oh, no, no, that's not what justification is. But that's, that's a part of it. You stand before God in Christ as though you never committed any evil. Whoa. Now, that's the negative side. The positive side, that, the reason that's, that's not just as if I never said, that's just a negative. Justification is more than a negative. Justification is the fact that he's positively imputed to you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is, it's as if you have always accomplished all the good God would ever expect from you. You say, but I didn't. I know, he did. And you're in him. And when God puts you in his son, he looks at you as though you never did all the things you remember doing because they're under the blood. And then he's given you his life, which means You've only accomplished all the things that he expected you to accomplish. That's who you really are. That's why your identification in Christ is so important. Romans chapter 2, when we get in Romans 2, we'll study this in detail. But the second, first part of Romans 2 talks about the justice of God and how it operates and gives you seven different principles that God's justice deals with people on. And every time you come up with one of them, you come up short. That's why it says in three, all of sin to come short of the glory of God. You don't measure up. But here's how, just read with me these verses. Verse number, chapter two, verse three. Thinkest thou, O man, that judgest them which do these things and doest the same, that thou should escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness or forbearance or longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness, an impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render, now watch, to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, what does he give them? If you have absolute perfect righteousness, God will give you eternal life. So how you doing? Not so good. I mean, to, to, not, to have absolute perfect, you, you by patient continuance, you've never misstepped. You've never failed to do the things you shouldn't do. You've never done the things you shouldn't do. You have absolute perfect righteousness. God's justice will give you eternal life. But since you don't have absolute perfect righteousness, chapter 3 says, but we before proved all under sin, and you know that yourself, what happens? Verse 8. But unto them who are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of them that doeth evil. That doesn't sound like a good end, does it? That's God's justice not clearing the guilty. But notice he says, if you have perfect righteousness, I'll give you eternal life. So when God justifies you, he gives you perfect righteousness. Therefore, you are qualified for him to give you what? Eternal life. You've got eternal life on the basis that God made you righteous in his son. The wage of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life because God has made you the righteousness of God in him. God is just in doing that because the Lord Jesus Christ has completely and totally paid for all of your sin debt, cleared the deck, and made it possible for him now to give you everlasting life. All of that truth is revealed in the gospel. Now, you go back to chapter 1, verse 17. For therein the righteousness of God is revealed. God's, how God can act righteously in justifying ungodly people on the basis of the redemption. He's just and justify them which believe in Jesus because the, the finality of the cross work is complete. When it says the righteousness of God is revealed, as I said, where is it revealed? Well, they already know about the character of God. 
But how God is going to righteously deal with sin is something that's now revealed in the gospel. Look over at chapter 3. Right. It's revealed in the gospel of Christ. Remember what Paul called that? He called it my gospel. That's because there's a special message given to the Apostle Paul about how God's going to deal with sin through the cross work of Christ that hadn't been revealed before Paul. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now, time passed, but now, ages to come. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So now... God's righteousness is manifest. Now it's revealed. The revelation of Romans 1, 17 comes through the gospel committed to the Apostle Paul. You're not going to find it previously in the Bible. The reason for that, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we've looked at these verses before. These verses are kind of the verses that, you know, we look at a lot. Because these are the verses that bring clarity to an understanding of what God's doing. And they just ought to make you happy to see the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 2, verse number 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world in our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If, if, if Satan and his crowd... If humanity and, 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 and its arrogance had known what God was going to do through the cross work of Christ, he'd have never allowed the Lord Jesus Christ to be crucified. So God kept that information secret so that he would take the crafty in his own craftiness. So you go back to the passage, Romans 1, 17, for therein, in the gospel of Christ, in Paul's gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed? Is, is, is God acting righteously on the basis of the cross work of Christ? It's revealed from faith to faith. Now that, that expression, from faith to faith, is, is an interesting expression. There's a lot of different ideas about what it means. There are places back in some touch from glory to glory and from truth to truth and from faith to faith. That's three times that, 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 that similar kind of thing. Friday night at the, uh, the Zoom meeting, it was, it was kind of interesting when when dan was teaching he went through the the times where paul says i lie not four times and when he got through he says anybody got any comments and one of the preacher one of the guys said there's a preacher he said hey man that was good i'm gonna that out loud to preach <laughs> and they began to talk about you know because they hadn't noticed, maybe noticed that before well when preachers see glory to glory truth to truth faith to faith they say whoa they've got and so there's all kind of discussion about what that phrase means. Probably, if you read commentaries, they tell you it's, it's the progress of faith, where faith from one degree to the next degree to the next degree, whether it's the transition from faith in the Old Testament, like Habakkuk, to faith in the New Testament, or more, more generally it's taught it's progression of, uh, the, it, it, as your heart grows and you get stronger and you get more faith and more faith and more faith. But to read that, that's reading into the verse. The verse that, that really didn't have much connection with the context. And for therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith. It has nothing to do with having God's right, got this message being revealed and so forth. So it, it doesn't really work. And the problem with that idea is that justification is not a growth process. Now that's Catholicism. But that's not Bible. Justification is not you growing into something. Justification is when God declares something, where he speaks it. And because he speaks it, it's true. Yeah. Just like in Genesis, God wanted to move, and he said, let there be light. And there was light. It's true because he said it. It's not something you grow. So the progressive idea just doesn't really work. If you go back to the book Habakkuk and notice something. Because he says, as it is written. And then he quotes Habakkuk chapter 2. Now let me know when you got Habakkuk. <laughs> if I tell you it's right in front of Nahum, did that help? <laughs> See, you, you've been watching too much TV and, 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 and you've been on, been on your cell phone too much. 
Now, for those of you that have your, you, you know, your, phone, your, your Bible on your phone there, you know, you found it real quick because you're, you're smart aleck. You know where the index is. But anyway, Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets. And Paul's going to quote Habakkuk 2 verse 4. In fact, three times in the New Testament this verse is quoted. Very unusual to have one Old Testament verse quoted three times in the New Testament. So it means it's a very important verse. And it's the text that Paul uses to base the book of Romans on. So it's an important verse. But I want you to notice how he quotes it. Habakkuk 2.4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. In other words, if you're proud, it's got a problem. But the just shall live by his faith. But you notice Paul didn't, he left out that word his. Galatians 3, when he quotes it again, he leaves out the word his. Hebrews 11, when Hebrews quotes it, it leaves out, the, it just says the just shall live by, they leave, the New Testament quotes leave out his. And so there's an idea that when he leaves out his, it's because in the Old Testament, a guy had to live by his faith. But now we live by faith that God gives you the ability to believe. And so when God gives you the ability to believe, God implants faith in you. And from faith to faith, God giving you God's faith being planted in you. And that's the old Calvinistic idea. By grace you say through faith, that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. It's the gift. What's the gift? Not, salve, not, not by grace you're saved, but faith. The problem with that is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the, not by God and planting it into you. It comes by you hearing God's word and then responding in faith to what his word says. So the idea of God implanting faith, that's a good theological idea. That's a common theological idea, but that's not what this verse is talking about. Probably... If you come back with Romans 10, probably the most sensible idea, and when I say that, I, I, I don't know exactly how to say it, but probably the, the, the most obvious meaning is that the idea the just shall live by the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. That being the idea that that it's revealed, the gospel is revealed by means of faith in the preacher. Here's a preacher who has faith in God's word, in the gospel of truth. And that faith in that gospel of truth causes him to preach the gospel. So it's, it's from the truth of the gospel that he, that he believes to a person who then can appropriate it by faith. So the idea there is that by the faith of the preacher, he preaches, then the hearer believes it because they trust God's word. You follow that? And that's really, if you look at Hebrews 10, that's really the process uh, of how this stuff works. Um, Hebrews 10, verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. People love to quote that verse, but prayer won't save you. I'm sorry. Look at the next verse. For how should they call upon him whom they have not? So calling without believing doesn't do you any good. Praying without trusting God's word doesn't do you any good. It's the believing that, that, that makes the calling valuable. How should they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how should they hear without a preacher? So the process is you have a preacher that preaches... The person hears what he preaches. The person then believes what he, what, what he preaches. And with a, with, with a heart, man believes under righteousness. So the guy gets, he, he gets, so but the process starts. I've got faith in this message. I believe the gospel of salvation. I believe the, that, that the gospel of Christ is the power of God of salvation. So I preach it. I preach it out of faith in, in God's word. And then someone hears it and then they trust what God's word says. And they get, and that's the process. That explains how, how, how the gospel has covered the world through the ages. That explains today. I mean, think about just in the last few weeks, I, I've, I've gotten communication from Brother Des in Africa. He, he's in Florida. He's ministering in Africa. Um, tremendous outreaching with the gospel there. 
Brother Richard Church up in, in Wisconsin, the ministry that he, he works with uh, in, in Africa. They just sent out a bunch of uh, reports about the, the various places where the gospel, how does that happen? Because there's some people believe the truth and they go and preach the truth. Brother, we have Brother, Brother Kyle and so forth in, in India. You get someone that can understand the truth, believe the truth and what they do, then they go preach the truth. And that's, that's how the gospel has gone all over the world. In India, in, in Ken, think of, you know, your old brother Carl Coates over there in, in the Netherlands. He was at the Zoom meeting the other night. It's like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning for him to be at the Zoom meeting. His little girl's with him. You know, she's like that. What, you know, she couldn't, I guess she can't sleep. She just got to be with her dear dad, stroke his beard. But she said, how does the gospel get to the Netherlands? Well, there it is. I just talked to a fellow down in Haiti. Look at Chicagoland. Think about, I mean, Brother Ted Fellows out in Ohio. Brother, brother, brother Reed, brother here, here Tony's going to go visit the folks in Ohio. Where does that come from? It comes from somebody believing God's word and preaching God's word. And you can go to California, you can go to Arizona, you can go to Tennessee, you can go to North Carolina, you can go to Louisiana, you can go to Mississippi, you can go to Maine, you can go to Michigan, you can go to Oregon, you can go to Washington. That's where Alex was last weekend. Indiana, Missouri, Colorado, New Mexico. I mean, just think of all the places you can go. How did it get there? Somebody believed it, preached it. I remember a guy, a preacher years ago, said, we'd have never got to the moon on free will offerings. The government had to confiscate money out of your pocket and pay for the moon. If, you're gonna, if you were going to cure cancer by free will offerings, you'd never cure cancer. But the gospel has gone around the world on the basis of free will offerings. Why? Because people have faith in it. Amen. So the idea of faith to faith is faith in, you put your faith, I've got faith in the truth that I'm believing, revealed to me, and I preach it, so it's from, out of my faith in God's word, and then it's to you to believe. And that's certainly probably the easiest and most obvious meaning. But... <laughs> I think there's a little more to it than that. That's all true. But there's something a bit more basic found in that quote from Habakkuk. If you go back over there with me, because I know you didn't turn away from it. <laughs> and Paul says in Romans 1.17, he says, as it is written. So this is Paul's text. He's told you back in verse number 2 that the gospel of God, which is promised to four by his prophets in the Holy Scripture, there's some good news that God has promised. He, he understands what the book says. He says that in chapter 3, we read the verse a minute ago in verse 1, verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, is revealed, now being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So here's his textual witness to justification by faith. In the gospel of Christ... The righteousness of God, his right way of dealing with sin, just and justify them who believe in Jesus, is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. So that phrase, from faith to faith, out of faith to the recipient, is based upon this text. The just shall live by faith. So Hebrews, Habakkuk 2, verse 4, and I said, he omits the word his. And that tells you, listen, if we were studying manuscript evidence, because that would be something I'd want to talk about. We're not doing that. That would be another 10 weeks. But this is what we, what we call, it's a free quote. God the Holy Spirit has a right to, to, to quote himself in any way he wants to. He knows what he intended when he wrote it. And he can apply it as he chooses. And, and there's, there's a whole raft of doctrine that we can study about that. But, but just for the moment, th this is a free quote. So it's not, a, it's not an error. There's something he's trying to get across here. In Habakkuk 2, starting verse 1, I will stand upon my watch. By the way, who's the smallest man in the Bible? <laughs> Nehemiah? Peter, he slept on his watch. Well, how about Habakkuk? He can stand on his watch. Oh. <laughs> yeah, 
it's okay. You can laugh. We yeah. thought we'd done be nothing but serious and long hair, didn't you? Hmm. Just because I got on a coat and tie. I will stand upon my watch and see, see and set me up a tower, up upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I'm reproved when I'm reproved. So the question is, what's God going to say to me and how am I going to answer? Okay? And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth. Now that verse is, it, when I was young, that verse was used and they said, well, it means, it, it's the idea that that, that, that He can run that reads. And the idea is you put a billboard and you run by and you can read the billboard. And so people use that verse and, and, and built gospel billboard ministry. That's not what it says. Write the vision, make it plain upon tables that he may run that reads. Not he that reads may run, but he that runs. What's he going to run? Well, if you read the whole context, it's run for your life. Judgment's coming. So put them, the vision's in chapter 3. And it's a vision of judgment. Verse number 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. I've said it's coming. It's going to be a while. But it's coming. It might tarry a little bit. But trust me, it's coming. Behold, his, his soul, that li- which is lifted up, is not upright within him. If you're self-sufficient and you're proud, you're not going to pay attention to what God says. But the just shall live by his faith. Now, what's his faith in? Whose faith is that? In one sense, it's, the, it's the, my faith... But what's my faith being? It's, it's, it's their, but what's their faith being placed in? What he's told them. It didn't come to pass. But listen, just because they didn't hear yet doesn't mean it didn't come. In because what he says will come to pass. So when the just shall live by his faith, it's the just shall live by the faithfulness of the one that said it. And my faith, trusting what he said. So when he says the righteousness of God from faith to faith, it's the idea to me, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It's the idea that it's revealed by from God's faithfulness to my trusting him. You follow that? Your faith resting in his faith, his faithfulness. Look at Romans chapter 3. That phrase, faith. Romans 3, verse 3. What if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Now when it says the faith of God, what's he talking about? Well, you can use the word faith in two ways. You can use it objectively or subjectively. Objectively is I have faith in you. You're the object of my faith. Subjectively as I have faith in myself. I am faithful to what I say. And when we use it subjectively, we're talking about our, our, the character of the person that's talking. There's somebody that will keep faith with what they say. They will, they're faithful. Well, obviously, the faith of God isn't God trusting somebody else. It's his trustworthiness. So when, God's, so that when you use it in the subjective sense like that, that's God's trustworthiness. If you look down at verse 22, and this is, this is a fascinating verse, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now, that's not faith in Jesus Christ. That's the faith of Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that what? Believe. There's faith in Jesus. Seven times Paul uses that phrase, the faith of Christ. And every verse that he uses it in, he uses it, the faith of Christ. And then he'll have a counterpart, your faith in him. The faith of Christ is not your faith in Jesus. It's his faithfulness to do what he says he's going to do. Jesus Christ, Hebrews 10 says, 
He says to the Father, I come to do thy will, O God. A body is thou prepared for me. Philippians says, he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. When Jesus Christ went to Calvary, he was going there in obedience to his Father's will. He trusted the will of his Father. Gave him a body, gave him a, a, a ministry. His faithfulness to the truth that God gave him. So the faith of Christ is your justification, verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus, by his faithfulness. So when he says the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, from the faithfulness of God to his word, to your trust in his word. So when you see that, you say, wow, the reason he omits the his is to take away the ambig ambiguity there because it's the righteousness of God that's now revealed in its fullness, in its completeness. Our faith is resting in a full revelation of all of his word. And there's no tarrying, there's no waiting for it. The reality is already here and we have it. So when you, when you read Romans 1 verse 17, if you don't have a life verse, that would be a good verse to start with. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. By the way, that verse is quoted three times. Each time it's quoted, the emphasis of the book that it's quoted in is on a different part of the verse. Romans says, the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3.11, it's the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10, it's the just shall live by faith. In Romans the issue is the standing, your identification, and your walk in grace. In Galatians, is that maintaining that sound doctrine that liberates you in your life. And in Hebrews, it's the only path to endurance and patient continuance and well-doing that will get them through the time of Jacob's trouble. So each one of those quotes has a different emphasis in the place it's quoted, but the whole foundation of everything is the just shall live by faith. And by the way, that word live, that's not simply exist in your life on earth because unbelievers continue to live. That word live there has to do with eternal life. Eternal life. Where you spend eternity and how you bring that everlasting life into your present possession right now. The wonderful thing about the, uh, about the salvation that's in Christ is it's not just a future guarantee out yonder. That's so wonderful. I talked to Sandy yesterday and Brother Gene Smith. They got word. He's been in the hospital over a week. And they got word that the, the stomach cancer is back and that they, they were going to take him off of the medications and stuff and, and put him on hospice, and hopefully he'll be able to be at home on hospice. And, and if you knew Gene, you know Gene, you know that you never talk to Gene more than five minutes, he's talking to you about the Lord. He's telling me about God comes in to repair his refrigerator, he's got the guy down, you know, got, got the guy sitting at the table going through verses. That's Gene. You know, you know what? His, his death might be, you know, he's 81 years old, so it's not really a shock. But he prepared for it decades ago by trusting Christ. And when you trust Christ, eternity is secure. But your present life now, you have that life. That's that thing in Romans 6, verse 13. We yield our members of, uh, uh, unto God as those that are alive from the dead. You have the capacity to live right now as though you're already alive from the dead. <laughs> Sin doesn't have to have dominion over you. When you live in the life that God, when you walk in the spirit, you live like who God's made you. It's all based on the just shall live by faith. You have eternal life by faith. But you have that life right now by faith in his word as is revealed to you through the ministry that God gives you through my gospel. Okay? So, praise the Lord. Now we're going to stand and sing number 90. You got two minutes to get get out of here. <laughs>
Number 90. <laughs>